welcome to the Talking, Teaching and Flow podcast. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for having me. It's it's truly an honor and, and I appreciate you giving me your time and, and being, you know, willing to talk about your career so far and your teaching and your methodology. So that's uh, that's awesome. I'm really, really grateful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I mentioned to a few friends of mine that um, I was going to have you on, on the show and I've, I've defined you as a uh, professional martial arts teacher. And a friend of mine said, does that exist? Do people actually make a living doing this? I was like, yeah, a few are good enough to do it, consistent enough and persistent enough to do it. And I think he's been doing it since 2009, 2010 or so. Um, and um, so we're going to be talking about his teaching methodology. But can we possibly start with with the fact that you are a professional, as in this is what you do on a full time basis? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. you coach every day, pretty much. Well, you, you said times. something very interesting because in normal time, I would. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are not normal time. No, they're not. Yeah. But uh, in normal time, yes, this is what I would do. Uh, but what do you mean by coach every day? Because obviously, uh, my my life as a martial art teacher is a broad church. I don't just teach in my school. I I teach international uh, seminars. Mm -hmm. I have people coming over uh, from all over the world. I I can, I can say that mm -hmm. uh, to see me uh, and, and learn from me privately at my beautiful studio here in Sardinia. I teach also my students at my school because obviously I run regular classes, uh, which are completely separated from Nubia. And I can go and explain that a little bit. Uh, more in details if you like me to. But yeah, so I do this every day on a regular basis. I don't have a second job. This is all I do. And now, in these uh, strange times of COVID, uh, I'm also um, developing the instructor development program, uh, which I would teach only on a physical level. Uh, I'm now, um, I have now decided, because I think this board is going to change for good, not saying that we're never going to travel together as freely, but I think there's going to be um, something happening here. Uh, because of these things like Zoom, for example, and, and the ability to share knowledge online have made people realize I can actually do a lot without having to travel all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, I thought, do you know what? I love traveling, but it's so much nicer. If I don't travel as much, but I can still deliver uh, uh, my teaching yeah. uh, to the to the best uh, of my standards uh, online, and then I thought, let's do this. And so I'm developing this instructor development program in a way that I do the modules online, but the examination, only the examination, has to be done physically, which I think is a good compromise. I, I I agree. It's very similar to what I do as well. My uh, I've got a teacher training course online, and then we have a week together um, at the end of it, which hopefully will be happening in July, where you know we we test everything out and and then we can have face to face conversations about the work itself. You mentioned Nuda, and Nuda is the name of of your system. Now I've described um, Nuda before as a martial arts cross training system with with a distinctive Southeast Asian feel. What is your definition of Nuda now? Nuda is uh, mm, a martial arts that uh, mm, in, in basically the, the whole the, the, the USP in martial arts is hard. To, to have because it's thousands and thousands of years of you know uh, lifespan and, and, and many people throughout history try to find the best fighting method. Okay, so the task is not uh, um, that the, the the task was to find an angle because my 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 uh, my speciality has always been. Uh, Filipino martial arts, the Southeast Asian martial arts in general, in the intersection between those uh, more traditional 
uh, ways of trading uh, and bringing them in the 21st century. This is really what was my 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 dream to find a way to make those art functional. So Luda is boxing supercharged with limb distractions and unorthodox attacks. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, but the key angle of Nunda is that functionality has to be more important than the the drills and the exercises behind uh, the uh, and, and the syllabus. Unfortunately, the syllabus uh, is taking over the functionality as. Uh, is not a priority anymore. You see that the functionality must stay the priority, not what is that is going to uh, uh, build you up to uh, become as functional as you need to be to be an effective fighter. So the syllabus is very important, but it has to be truly tuned to make you a functional fighter and not just to create another material pyramid scheme. You know what I'm talking about because there's plenty of people probably in your field as well teaching a lot of you know fluff and the yeah. fluff and the fluff is taught because creating more and more fluff creates more and more material to teach and people get hooked and they and they think oh if I if I could only learn that as well then I'll get it so I don't do that. I give you an extremely detailed syllabus, an extremely scientifically developed program that will make you ultimately an effective fighter in all ranges of combat, but you have to follow that process to a T. You can't just go in there and start going, oh, I'll only take this and I'll only take that, and then I will make my own pyramid skin. I, I just... Um, that's what kind of makes me a little bit different from the rest, I think. And although everybody says, yeah, but I'll do the same. And some people, look, is sincerely convinced that what I say is true. But in my experience in life, sincerity is not always a statement of truth. You can be convinced and sincerely convinced that what you're doing is going to do that. But is that, though, then only somebody that has invested in martial arts or in any or in any craft with all this heart and passion and soul can see the difference. Mm -hmm. My goal is to show the difference and to explain directly, straight away, even to people that approach me for the first time, whether it's a beginner or an advanced martial artist, that if you want to do well and develop and develop skills and become truly uh, invested in what you have to learn, you must draw all the questions. You must draw every preconcept you might have built throughout okay. the years. Okay. And I, I, let me, I'm sorry to cut you. I want us to, to delve into this at, at some point because you're talking about learning strategies um, and that's something slightly different. So okay. yes. I, I, I hear you. Thank you. So the point you're making, I think, is very much about differentiating functionality from aesthetics. What looks fluffy to actually what freaking works. And yeah, it and, has to have both. It needs to look good, but your your main goal in a combat martial art mm -hmm. must be functionality, not just to look good. Yeah. Awesome. And Nuda looks good. Nuda looks does look good. Uh, yeah, I was attracted to. Uh, oh, it's true that the boxing aspect um, is is a beautiful art. Uh, and you can see it in there. But there's something in Nuda, I remember when you and I first met, must have been 10, 12 years ago, something like that, where I saw the boxing, but I saw uh, um, aesthetically something else also. And obviously that's the Southeast Asian Filipino martial arts that was coming through with your own flair, your own body, your own physical, perhaps Italian, Mediterranean way of moving about space as well. That's that's you know that's right there it, it's part of the the artwork um that really attracted me and i thought wow this looks like not only it would work but it also looks well it looks good whilst whilst being functional yeah, so exactly. where i can stand i can i can vouch <laughs> for nuda looking good and and being functional enough although i haven't got into any fights to try you know the few things you've 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 taught me but 
Yeah, interesting. When talking about art, martial art is an art. You know, it's still a form of art. Mm-hmm. So it, it has to have aesthetics. Otherwise, it's not a martial art. It's something else. I hear you. I hear you. Um, I'm, I'm going to take you back a bit to your own journey as, as a, um, not necessarily a beginner, but someone, because I know that you are a teacher and you are a maestro and you have very advanced um, fighters coming to train with you, but you are also very keen on always calling yourself a student. Absolutely. And there was a period of time I've, I've, I did some reading about you, uh, researching you and, and Nuda before this conversation. And something came up that I thought I'll, I'll bring up to you and, and for you to expand on. And the phrase goes like this. Um, I had two choices, run away and pretend nothing had happened or stay there and learn. I chose to stay. So I'd like us to go into that concept of humility and learning, even for someone like yourself who, who's been in a game for a very, very long time. Can, can you talk to us about those periods of time where the functionality of what you thought you knew and was working very well in your training gets a bit slapped around the face and you're like, okay, shit, actually, perhaps I should either stay right here and learn from this guy who, or I can just, as you say, go somewhere else, pretend this never happened and stay fluffy. Humility and learning for you, because I know you're confident, but you're also very humble. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think life is all about balance. You are also very humble, but you're also very confident in what you mm-hmm. do. And I think we... We should all aim to become that. We should become the best we can be in our field, uh, but still keeping an integrity uh, and a way about ourselves of being humble. Because uh, at the same goes, the more you learn, the less you know. Mm-hmm. Is how it is. Mm-hmm. What happened to me uh, is, is, is it's great that you're referring to that particular uh, episode. Then. It's great that you're actually using the same... <laughs> Words that I used to describe that on the on the blog that I wrote, especially about that particular moment. Um, what happened is that uh, I, I got invested in, in, in training, and I was training, uh, especially Filipino martial arts. The last stage of my life was focusing a lot on that, and especially with the weaponry, uh, with the sticks, I thought I reached a very high standard, which in fact it was fairly high. But then I, I went to Germany to train Filipino martial arts with a true Filipino mm-hmm. uh, master. They had a very different approach to stick fight. And the students were training a lot less than I was. And I basically myself, because I just wanted to experience it, and the only way to experience truly effectiveness uh, or how effective a martial arts can be is to actually train and spar. Doesn't have to be a full on war, in fact, you have to have a go. Um, so uh, there was uh, a guy called Martin, uh, and I, I asked him, you know, can we do a little spar together? And he was like, yeah, but, but you know, we don't have padded sticks at the moment. And I was like, no, no, let's go with normal sticks. And I went, okay. And so he said, yeah, okay, we can do that. But, you know, these are real sticks. I said, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> so we started trading. Uh, I, I still have the video somewhere. I, I, I would I would definitely put it up once I, did. I find it. I have to just, because I've got mini cassettes and I have to uh, convert, it. convert it into digital. But I still have the video. It's hilarious. Because, I, I, you know, in, in Filipino martial arts, especially the... The, the more traditional or, or, or popular version of it. A lot of people is there and they do all these amazing stuff with the sticks and they move their hands very fast. And you just go, wow, if that guy gets me, I'm fucking dead. But they don't move. They're stuck with their feet. Mm-hmm. They don't have any footwork going on. And so I was there ready to kill the guy. As soon as he walks in, I'm going to do all this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to strip this. Is, 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 is thick and I'm going to disarm it, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. It just, it just wouldn't be there. So once he found out that that's all I wanted to do, I had, I was at one trick point. All I, I could do was that. And he was moving around me, teasing me, taking the piece of me. He was battering me everywhere. He battered my head, my shoulder, my arm, uh, my legs. 
And at one point, I just went crazy. And I went like, oh, fuck it, I'm going to hit him now. And he just went like this. And he threw his sticks right at my eye. I still had the scar. And I, and I cut myself. And he was like, stop, you got to stop. I was like, oh, we ain't fucking stopping. We only started. He said, look, you've got to stop. You're bleeding. And I was like, yeah, but just a little scratch. I said, Antonio, if I start going too long, I fucking break your head and I split it in half like a melon. You just don't have anything to give me. You are not much for me. I'm sorry, my friend, but Mm -hmm. you're here to learn. And that was a waking up moment. And I welcome moments like this in my journey because this is where I get started again. And I will improve what I have already. But the only way to improve what you are already is to be ready to, you have to drop the, the, the stuff you don't need. Mm. It's like if you move in a bigger house, there's no point bringing the whole house. You've got to drop stuff. you got to leave stuff. Although, you, although there is still space in the new house where you can fit everything, some things just won't fit the house. Mm-hmm. It's the wrong furniture. It's the wrong feel. You've got to move on and you've got to drop bags. That you might get attached to, but attachment is is weakness. Is a weakness. Yeah, I hear you. This is what happened. Yeah, hum- humbling experience, right? <laughs> I had many, but that was the most humbling I had. I see. Because this guy was a student. He's been training a couple of years, and mm-hmm. I was already invested in six, seven, eight years in the Filipino martial arts and this and that. And this guy was just like so way above me. And I, I, that was humbling. But then that proved, that proved that what I was learning was valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What's your journey like? Uh, I know you started with karate and then obviously you got involved into in, uh, Jeet Kune Do. Um, I started, sorry, say, say that again. You started with karate. Karate. Ah, karate, yes, yes. Yeah. And then you moved on into Jeet Kune Do and moved to London to study with quite a few interesting people. Um, Bruce Lee has been a, a massive influence on, I, I, I want to believe anyone around our age, because I think we are around the same age, um, in our 40s, if I'm not mistaken. Um, how has Jeet Kune Do influenced, and Bruce Lee, I would say, in terms of developing his own philosophy, his own teaching and practice methodology, how has that influenced you? Oh, it was all the influence I ever needed. Uh, mm. the, it's a very interesting character, very overhyped, yes, misunderstood mm-hmm. uh, character. Overhyped because, in truth, we don't know how good it really was. Yes, there is a, a sparring session with his uh, student, Danny Osampo, somewhere, which I think shows. Uh, some really uh, solid stuff uh, of him. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't a... I mean, it was fully protected. Yeah, he had a, 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 a protective head gear that covered the top of his face as well. I mean, it, it was completely covered. He had shin pads and, and forearm pads and, and he had uh, all sort of protection all, all over his body. So I never saw Bruce Lee other than in his movies. But mm-hmm. those are choreographed uh, with the choreography. So, um, so I never saw Bruce Lee dealing with uh, um, the uncomfortable and the pain. Because how do you deal with pain? There is only one way to deal with pain. Yeah. There is only one way to deal with pain, and you learn that from training. And the trick to pain is that you still feel it. It's not that you don't feel it. Uh, the deal with pain, to deal with pain, you have to pretend it's not there. So there is a great movie, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, mm-hmm. where he, he, this guy is telling, no, you, you know, you don't feel pain. How do you know? I said, no, it's not that I don't feel it. Because he saw his, uh, he saw this guy, Lawrence of Arabia, right? lighting up much, and much would go straight into his finger and it wouldn't blink. And, and the guy goes, how do you do that? That's impossible. How do you do that? It must be a secret technique. Is it the breathing? Is it it's like that? I still feel the pain. I just pretend it's not there. I don't let it 
get me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't know how Bruce Lee would have dealt with that. And that's the, the question we all have about him. However, he was an, a guy that brought together the, the East and Western culture uh, for the very first time, possibly in history, uh, through martial arts. And I think he was genuinely uh, more into martial arts than acting at one point. Mm-hmm. And that's when he developed this philosophy of Jeet Kune Do. And the beauty about Jeet Kune Do as a philosophy is that he himself knew that he was only scratching the surface, but the goal for him was to find his own expression in the art. And that's when, he's, when he called uh, Jeet Kune Do uh, his, his uh, philosophy, because he never had the time to develop a complete system. Yeah. He was experimenting with boxing, bringing in Wing Chun, uh, which is the you know, a Chinese form of Kung Fu, uh, well, I call it Kung Fu, but, you know, I mean, it's a Chinese mm-hmm. martial arts, but he developed in China. Um, but he was also experimenting with boxing and, and fencing. And he thought, okay, uh, let's get the best out of everything and make it useful and then drop the classical mess, he would refer it to as traditional martial arts, the, all the flowers, all the dancers, but then they don't get to the point. Mm-hmm. That's why he is considered by Dana White, which is the president of the UFC, the godfather of martial arts, of mixed martial arts, of MMA. Because in principle, he was the very first person in the world, in modern time, mm-hmm. to actually think we have to bring things together and yeah. make a, a 360 degree uh, world. We can't just be purists and learn how to box or to kickbox or just grapple. We have to be able to do both. And within those arts that we learn, we're always going to have our favorite aspect, but we shouldn't get enslaved or trapped in it. Because if that, that's the mistake I would have made myself, I'm trying to fight that, oh, Filipino martial arts, I'm the best now. Everybody knows my name in that. Let's focus on that. Mm-hmm. No, you don't grow. So he influenced me in enormously, especially in creating my own name with Mundo, because he would encourage his students to find their own name because that would mean you have to find your own expression of the arts that you learn. So my teacher, my main teacher, in, uh, Terry Barnett, he has uh, something that he called integrated art. That is Barnett. But he is a full instructor in Jeet Kune Do. Mm-hmm. One of the very first full instructor in Jeet Kune Do in Europe under Danny Santo, which was a direct student of Bruce Lee. And Terry Barnett allowed me, and if I wanted to, to use his name, Integrated Arts, but also said, you go ahead and find your own name, mm-hmm. yeah. because uh, Bruce Lee he would encourage his students to do that. So how much he has influenced me? Oh, massive. Yeah. And the name Nuda means nothing. And this comes from Bruce Lee as well, because he would say, if they ask you what Jeet Kune Do is or isn't, let the name drop, because that's what it is. It's only a name. And in the, in the task of finding my own name, I wanted something that would represent uh, something that in Japanese they call Mushin, which is the highest state for a samurai or, or level of mastery in swordship. So Mushin is when you stop thinking and you just you become the sword mm-hmm. there is no pre-cons uh, pre-thought or anything it's just pure action and it's basically what everybody experiences when they drive their car it's that it's just that you know you you, you, you pick up your phone in your car not that you should not that you should you should but you know what i mean you mm-hmm. change the gear you know you scratch your head you are completely in control that's your motion that's you doing without having to think but then I thought, I'm not Japanese, and, you know, I'm Sardinia, I'm, 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 in, I'm, I'm in, an immigrant in England, and I want to pay tribute to my land. And so I thought, no, that would be good, because it's short, it's, 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 it's powerful, uh, uh, but also it's from Sardinia. But then, it wasn't the only reason. The other reason is because Bruce Lee said, let the name drop, if, if that's what they say. Because if they want to fuss about the name, it's just a name. I am Antonio. No, my name is Antonio. This is not what I am or who I am. I just call like that. 
And uh, my favorite book is The Odyssey. The Odyssey is my favorite book. And Odysseus, Ulysses, my favorite hero. Uh, when he got caught by the giant cyclone, that one had a cyclone. Uh, and, you know, we, we all know the story. Uh, be, you know, the cyclone uh, asked him his name when, when Ulysses was giving him this, the wine to get drunk. Yeah? And he said, oh, you're giving me this wine, so I'm going to eat you last. What is your name? Uh, and he said, like, my name? My name is nobody. And when they blinded the cycle, but they managed to escape, he was screaming. And all the cycles were there to help him. And he said, like, why are you screaming? Who hurt you? And he was like, nobody did. Nobody did. I was like, nobody did. Mm -hmm. So I'm, that, that was the genius of your life. And I thought, like, this is how not important it is to focus on names and, 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 and to truly focus on finding yourself in the, in the craft that you practice, never mind martial arts, you are not the art that you practice. The art doesn't define you as a yoga uh, practitioner or, or, or as a martial artist. It's you that define the martial art in your own expression of it. You mm -hmm. define yourself in the art. The martial art, the art that you practice, doesn't define you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for this. Yeah. yeah. The, the concept of embodiment is, I think, a, a very interesting one because I find myself reading um, and coming across blogs and articles and some lovely people, very well intended, very well intentioned um, people who call themselves embodied this or embodied that. And there's a bit of a, of a paradox in there. And that if you are truly embodied, you don't need to call yourself embodied. The concept of embodiment is that you will eventually lose whatever name you're actually using, first and foremost, the name embodiment or embodied. So I, I relate to that in on so many ways. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm going to read you something and I'd love for us to expand and, and chat about that. What makes you a better person is the fact that in combat training, you are not allowed to quit. You might end up with your back on the ground and someone trying to punch your head off your shoulders. But with rigorous mental and physical training, you know that you can turn that situation around and reverse it. If you don't give up, you will eventually prevail against all odds. This is what makes you a better person. You don't quit. That's my word, isn't it? It is. I'm <laughs> quoting you. I'm quoting you because you have this motto with within your school, no if, no buts. Yeah. And very much, you know, professing that training hard is where it's at, but more importantly, not training is where it's at. Now, my question and my query about this is, how does one build the capacity to be willing to put themselves there? It doesn't necessarily come with and to everyone freely does it sometimes it's pushed upon us so how do you do you as a coach teacher trainer um invite people to build that capacity to simply not quit it, it has to be done in stages mm -hmm. but you can't just bully people around into becoming tough they begin tough tough enough toughening up it's a process a bit like walking I guess when if you do yoga on on a wooden floor and you never done it before, you get you know splinters in your feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got to do it over and over again, and then again, and then uh, and then the skin gets stuff. So you need to create an environment where people are feeling are not feeling afraid. That's the key. Mm -hmm. Not to create the environment that is tough or right, tough you up. You could do that if you become a professional soldier, maybe. But we're not soldiers. You have to create an environment, an environment where you, you develop an environment where people feel welcome and not scared. But it's not an environment that keep on working on retention just because they want their money. Because that person will be welcome and he won't be scared until the day they will become scared. Because they will be that day. Because mm -hmm. as you as you develop and you get tougher and stronger, things are gonna get harder. 
And then you have to look around and go, well, how the fuck are the oldest people still here? Mm-hmm. And I am today feeling, un, you know, uncomfortable. I feel pain. I'm out of breath. My my rib might snap if I don't stop. But then it doesn't, does it? You know, it, this is what you have to do. You have to, to take people through the journey at the right pace. You need to be patient, but you need to be firm. Mm-hmm. Patient. There's no if, no but here, which means you can't give up. If you're here to give up, you give up when you leave as well. So not giving up means how many push-ups can you do? I can do three. Let's start with three. And then you go, you have to try to do five. How about trees? I'm doing three really well now. Can I do three forever? You can, but you ain't going to fucking do anything with it. Mm -hmm. And then there you go. So you have to go five. Yeah, but it gets tired. Yeah, I don't know. It's a bit like kids, really. Even adults can still be kids. So how does a child learn to walk? They crawl. And, and a good parent makes them crawl and, 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 and play. It becomes a playful game. Come mm-hmm. on, on your feet. Come to daddy. Come to daddy. Are you ready to hold them up? You don't let them drop every time, but you hold them up. But then you go further away. Come and play, come and play, but you go further and further. And those little legs get stronger and stronger. It's, it's exactly this. This is what you have to do. But how do you make sure they don't give up? You have to lead by example as well. I don't give up. Why would you give up? If I don't give up, you don't give up. Otherwise, you can't call yourself my student. If you're a quitter, I don't want you here. This is not a place for quitters. So do you want to be a quitter? It's really easy. Once you ask, do you want to be a quitter or a winner? Because all these people are winners just because they're still here. Mm -hmm. I know people from all walks of life, from all ages. They trained with me for ages and years. You know, especially when I was in London, I, all my students were senior executives in, in the city, real winners. And they loved my no is no boss mentality. I wouldn't treat them any different from the, the other guy. I don't mm-hmm. care how much you are. When you're here, you give me your best. But not your best at work. I don't give a shit. You give me your best here. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I remember you saying, uh, uh, training hard is the only hard thing people should really focus on in martial arts. Everything else is just speculation and quite frankly uh, is a waste of time in my it opinion. Is, it is, it is. But training hard does it have to be, I mean hard is, is, is an interesting word. Because, oh hard, no, I don't want to do hard. Yeah, no, everything is hard. Mm-hmm. Anything of value is hard. I went to a yoga class one day, I was like, I'm killing I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> no, but this is not meant to be hard. It's meant to be, you know, breathing and relaxing and listening to bad music. Mm-hmm. That's fucking hard. <laughs> so what is hard? Yeah. Hard is anything you don't know how to do. And when you learn, then it becomes not so hard. Yeah. And then yeah. you toughen up. Mm. True, true, true. Let, let us talk, um, Antonio, if it's okay with you about something hard. And um, you've been quite public about the fact that you've had surgery once or twice on your shoulders. I know that you've had your back walked on because um, that was many years ago when we briefly walked together. Um, But I also read somewhere or I've heard you speak about that time when you find yourself on the bed, on your bed, by yourself, not being able to do what you normally do, what you're known for, where, you know, your your spirit is, is a bit dimmed. And you have to literally fight to find that fighting spirit of yours to come back to um, um, Bruce Lee, who you know famously wrote quite a lot of his book on while on, whilst on his back and being told he would never walk again. Something fairly similar, um, I, I believe, happened to you in the sense that you've been stretched and you've been challenged to uh, perhaps start looking at uh, what you were doing with yourself and what the future would hold for you. So can we go into that and talk about the mental aspect of having your body somehow rubbed away from you and your practice and your teaching not being what it's used to be simply because you're going through some stuff? How, where do you find or where did you find and what made it work for you that you were somehow able to pull through 
um, and get back into shape and perhaps even a better shape? Um, that's a very good question. The answer is, I think it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a few different answers. A, I think we are, we are wired differently and I, I am wired to a deal. Mm -hmm. So it probably counts for genetics as well. I'm just quite like that. But you can rewire yourself to do it. I'm just lucky that, you know, my, my core is, was wired like that. I'm wired to endure. Because I have endured many things in my life. We all have. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my, I had to do some really hard stuff when I was much younger. And I dealt with it. So by the time the injury got me, during my martial arts training and all that, I was already tough and hard. But I think uh, what I've learned is that um, there is an opportunity in any in any tragedy. There is an opportunity to so everything happens for a reason. Is that true? Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure about all the. You know, some people talk about everything happens for a reason. If you ask me, does everything happen for this world, Tony? I do know one thing. Everything happens, and what you make out of it might give you a reason. <laughs> but if you don't make anything out of it, there is no reason. Shit happens. You know, it's, it's how you deal with it that matters, not what happens. And what happened to me that I've learned that uh, through injuries, which, and I had many, I could focus on other stuff. What do you mean? Meaning, when I had my back. Uh, no, that was so. When I had my back, I, I left that room. Before my back, I had my 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 uncle. I was in a fight in a club in London uh, against two guys, and I was doing well. But then at one point, I couldn't stand anymore. I was just like boom, collapsing on the floor all the time. Just my leg wouldn't hold on to hold up, and then when, when we got separated, and, and all the security moved people away, and all my I, I looked at my my uncle and it was like this big, I had like an elephant, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so everything was well, was shattered and broken, and uh, and I got taken into the hospital in London, and they had to reconstruct my bones with the, with the, with the titanium screws and all shit. I see. It was tough. I was like, oh my God. So I decided to come back to Sardinia for a few months because I thought like, I can't work on a country. There's no point in me staying in London. So I just go back for a while. And I called uh, one of my martial arts teachers and I said, look, I have to go back because of this and that. And he was like, okay. That's a shame because we're getting close to the brown belt grading. And then there would be a black belt grading. And I'm like, yeah, I know, just, you know, I didn't realize I was any close to the black belt grading. And they were like, Antonio, you are probably the hardest working uh, student I've never had. And right now, I wanted to ask you if you wanted to consider doing the black belt grading. And I was like, fuck you now. That's because here's the thing, Ref, I'm, Russian for, for the first three years in London, this all I did was working part time and hard. It's hard in London working part time because it's an expensive place. Yeah. But all I did was working part time so that I could train. I'm mean, gonna say something here, not just trying to be funny or anything, but for two years, the first two years in London, I hardly ever had sex. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't go out. Mm -hmm. I didn't. I didn't care. I was just. It was an obsession. I just wanted to train and be the best. So this has happened, and I called one of my teachers and said, like, Look, I think, uh, you know, why don't you go back and use this time, like Bruce Lee did, in Boris Booth, maybe, maybe he's going to help you to structure things, and I'm like, wow, what a clever way to, to, to look at things, yeah? Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is what we have to do. We have to find reasons for... Uh, for things when they happen, but it's not guaranteed that you will find a reason until you want to find a reason. Do you, you see what I mean? Yeah. So something happens, something bad, you can cry about about it, you can 
you can play the victim game, you can do you know, all sorts. Or you go, okay, how do I use this time wisely? And that's, that's the game that I play. Over the last, uh, about the last injury, because you know, I got for that because and then I got under the knee and then, and then the back and the back was really bad and then the shoulder, the left shoulder, and now the right shoulder. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I thought about quitting because mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you know, I had enough. I can't mm-hmm. fucking just break it because it's, it's excruciating. And it's also heartbreaking because what, I, what, what is that I love the most out of their life is training. Mm. And if I don't train, I am sad. And I couldn't, I couldn't move my arm anymore. I was like, oh my God, I have to do surgery again. I was like, that's it. Um, Maybe I'm just, you know, maybe really this is a wake up call. I was getting really down and negative about it. And then I I thought, let's do surgery and see how it goes. And then when I had the surgery, it was fucking hard because the doctor told me, your shoulder is a mess up. Now I'm going to fix this. But I want you to promise me that you will never get injured like that again because you're pushing 50. Although I may not look at, I am pushing 50. You know, you look great as well because we keep, in, you know, in shape and fit, but we are we're getting older. This is the fact. And, and the recovery time is a lot longer mm-hmm. as well. And and I'm just like, I was like, okay, I promise I won't do anything silly ever again. So I got through surgery and it was hard. Jesus, the pain, because it really was uh, two snap severe tendon, the bicep tendon and the sopraspinat was completely gone. It was tough. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And after surgery, it was so painful. It took me almost two months to regain full movement, full movement. And then I went to see the doctor and he said, like, show me what you can do. And I was like, this and I that. He looked at me and he said, like, what the fuck are you doing? How can you move shoulders like that already? I was like, what do you mean? Are you not happy? It's like, I'm telling you, this is incredible. You shouldn't be doing this already. This is something I would expect you to do after eight months to a year. This is great, but don't play the fool. Promise me you will be careful, and this is what I'm doing. So now I'm building my strengths, and I'm focusing on bodybuilding, which is something I've never done before, mm. and I should have, because when you do bodybuilding, when you do bodybuilding, it, your body is stronger. Your joints are protected by the muscles. Yeah. And so the, this is now what I'm doing, and, and I'm focusing on this, and, and it's great. I feel stronger than ever. This mm. shoulder, never been this be strong. And by the time I make a full recovery, this guy is great. Mm-hmm. And 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 what have I done during this time? I'm doing my gym completely from scratch. I will build as electrician, making it. It's gonna be a world class facility. I cannot wait for it to be done. And I'm developing the dojo, but I'm also developing a filming studio where I'll do all the material, mm-hmm. teaching online. I'll get you over as well. We'll do something together, I promise you. Mm-hmm. And I'm so happy. So what have I done? Again, utilize this as a chance. What is this chance? The chance you got to figure out for yourself. And so what I'm saying is when tough time comes, they won't give you the answer. Tough time comes, you have to figure out the answer. As long as you look for answers, they will come to you. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, was, well, yeah. Thank you for sharing, because um, I know that I know the feeling. <laughs> Injuries put us in places where it, it makes you doubt everything in terms of the past, the present, and the future, and and you somehow have to um, walk it through, walk through it, and and be patient with yourself, forgive yourself for putting yourself there in the first place, and as you said, I think beautifully learn from it, and then make the most of it. Okay. Um, because right now you've been and gifted, you've been gifted the time to actually focus on other things. That if you had been training thirty hours a week, you just, you how, just your mind wouldn't be there. How beautifully you put this now as a major. You've been gifted the time because the most patient thing in life is not money. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. time, isn't it, Rafa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. This, yeah, is what yeah. COVID has, this is what COVID has done for many of us, right? 
You said it. You gift, you've been gifted the time, <laughs> the time to think, the time to do. Yeah. Is is is. Uh, I think I've learned this. Uh, I read it somewhere. I can't remember where, but it's a very interesting read, and uh, and 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 they were explaining the difference between a teenager and an adult. I mean, uh, teenagers always blame something for whatever happens to them. Others take full responsibility. They never blame circumstances. They blame themselves for the circumstances they're in. But it's not uh, always blame yourself and make yourself down and call yourself stupid. This is not what I'm talking about. But blaming yourself is like, yeah, it's my fault. I shouldn't have done this. My shoulder got fucked. Maybe I should have been careful. Maybe I should have done bodybuilding before. And then it would have held up a little bit. Maybe I should have been overtraining for three years and get all these free radicals going and running by and fucking things up. So maybe it's my fault. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and I need to stop just for a sec. No problem, I'm here. Nice one. Um, let's circle back and close that loop um, where we talked about you as a coach and trainer and teacher and your teaching methodology and what you've learned. But I also know, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, that you are very much a learner and constantly a student. And uh, I, I read this, which I, I loved um, on your blog. I feel kind of drained if I end up only teaching. There needs to be a balance. You give something out, energy and knowledge, and you need to get something back, energy and knowledge. Then the balance is restored. Um, I love that because I think this is, it's been the way for me and the teachers that I know and respect that um, you appreciate that you need to be fed. And if you spend most of your time feeding others, eventually your energy is going to deplete to such a level that you're going to start renouncing <laughs> and, and, and being aggy against everyone. So making sure that you, you, you take care of yourself by putting yourself in a position of, of a learner and constantly uh, being a student is a, a safe way to somehow keep being a good teacher. Can we possibly close our conversation with, with what you've learned both recently and over the years as a student that you've carried into your teaching and into your life? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, for me, it's easy because some of the happiest times and memories in my life are... Um, if I uh, derived from when I was actually a student. So I just love being there as a student. Mm. The only thing that I make sure of is that I'm learning from a good teacher and a person I also like. It doesn't have to be just good. I have to like the person. Otherwise, I'm not interested. But I, as long as I meet someone that can meet those standards for me, I, I am the happiest student in the world. Mm. Um, what I've learned as a student that I brought uh, with me uh, as a teacher is that uh, you know I I invented the phrase learn to teach and teach to learn uh, quite a few years back and it's been used a lot because right? like they all say you know imitation is a form of, form, of, form of flattery the highest form of flattery it pisses me off to be honest but it's been used a lot especially in the in the Filipino martial arts community, but I was the one to come up with this thing. So that's the biggest lesson I learned, is that you've got to learn to teach, and you've got to teach to learn. When you start a journey with the end in mind, and my journey in mind was, I'm not interested so much about being a competitor. My journey in martial arts is the knowledge journey. I want to become knowledgeable. And I want to become a great teacher. So I was learning to teach in my journey, not just to fight. Fighting and becoming able to look after myself and to defend myself is the primary reason, of course. But the most important reason was for me to go through the path of becoming a great teacher because you owe that to your student. So in, in, uh, in, in learning, you got to listen without always asking yourself, is he telling me something I already know? You need to stop the comparison which, which, which that is between what you think you know 
and what is being, you've been actually taught. Mm-hmm. You need to stop that. The paradigm needs to, to switch. You've got to become empty. You've got a sponge. When you get a sponge and it's dry, you dump it in the water and you absorb the water. The same sponge, if it's still full of water and you dump it in the water, no more, no more water can go in. You need to squeeze anything that you think you know and empty the sponge that is your brain in order, in order to absorb again. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. You've got to stop trying to figure out how much you know or what the person is about to teach you. Because here's the thing, right? And you know this because you, you are an expert in your craft and you've been investing in life time into your field. You know, you, you're an interesting character because you are, and me like me, you're interested in the truth of teaching and learning. Uh, it's, it's a car for you to become a, a, an excellent teacher. Teaching mm-hmm. is what you love the most. True. Yeah. I, uh, you know, is the knowledge. And how do I pass on that knowledge that really makes you stand out? Now, um, the, 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 the trick is to, you got to destroy your ego. Mm-hmm. That's the goal. Kill the fucking bastard. Kill the ego and you'll be free. To learn and then to teach. Yeah. Yeah, this is it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. It's interesting you mentioned in the, uh, the teaching aspect. I mean, obviously, this show is called the Talk in Teaching and Flow podcast. And <laughs> it is something you've picked up very, very well in that and I found myself from time to time explaining to people that I, I, well, I'll put it this way. I remember having a conversation with someone called Ido Portal. And during a, a workshop he was teaching, he said to us, you know, the truth is when you meet a good teacher, it doesn't matter what they teach. If you recognize a good, great teacher, you will learn them. You think you came here to learn boxing, but he's a violin teacher, he's going to teach you violin. Teaching has got its own science and art behind it. And I've always been a fan of that. It's very, very true. And as you were just sharing this with us, um, I was reflecting on what got me onto the path of teaching what I teach now. And especially comparing it to a few friends of mine, my brothers, people close by, um, how life, basically, what life throws at you, as you say, shit happens. And depending on the shit that happens to you, you are going to, to, to mold into something. And if you're born to teach, then you are going to teach whatever is in relation to this. I am thinking about a good friend of mine um growing up with and one day he got jumped by a couple of guys so you know it was it was it wasn't well basically physically but he became a fighter um you know and then became an instructor a mixed martial arts instructor that shit happens to him and he made something out of it and eventually talked others how to defend themselves if a situation like this happened for me my back went I was a musician for 15 years and all of a sudden, sudden I could not play anymore. And it was a case of, okay, what is going to give me the mobility that I needed in order to get back into my art form again, in order to be a man again? So yoga was the path and I eventually started teaching that. And it's interesting from time to time, and that's going to be my last question for you, that even if I want to say I was born to be a yoga teacher, the truth is I've worked out for myself that it is not true. I've worked out that I was born to be a teacher. What I was going to be teaching was done to literally sheer luck. Because depending on what had happened to me, that was going to be the thing that I was going to get me obsessed enough to become good enough to become then a teacher. So in my case, it was yoga in relation to back pain, but it could have very much be a physical an, an altercation on in the streets or somewhere else that turned me into a mixed martial arts uh, or a boxing coach or you or a fencing guy or you na- you name it now something tells me that you were born to be a teacher because there's something in you that i've recognized you know it takes one to know one that you you like the sharing of knowledge yeah, yeah, yeah. you and i had conversations outside of the dojo and and you like the sharing of knowledge the, the, the companionship of people sharing knowledge with each other and l- learning from you also what do you think you were born to do or born to teach 
Mm. I have because a, with the culture, because nudine obviously is the martial art that it is is the form. N nudai is the, is the vehicle f through which you you are the teacher to all these people and all these fighters. But if it wasn't nuda, I'm pretty freaking sure that well, I think, uh, you'd be a teacher too. I think uh, I'll give you a practical example, which will answer your question. A very good friend of mine, um, actually, now we trace that, it wasn't a very good friend of mine. Somebody I knew since I was a kid, and he was my worst enemy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we used to fight a lot. And we became friends by being enemies, you know, when kids. Yeah, you know, uh, friend enemy, friend enemy. Mm -hmm. friend enemy. And, you know, uh, he was always stronger than me physically. He would beat me up all the time. I would fight him every time. Until one day when we were teenagers, I stood up to him and I beat him. Like in a way that you can beat someone when you're a teenager. Now, when you're a teenager, you can beat someone like an adult. Mm -hmm. And he, he took it. And from then, we became friends because finally I got him to respect me and to fear me as well. Yeah. Because respect comes from fear as well. A little bit of fear needs to be there, otherwise you, you won't get the full respect. A few years back, recently, he approached me and said, like, uh, I'm telling you, I need to talk to you. He split up with his ex-partner. Uh, uh, whom he has a child with. And uh, she started seeing another guy and the guy was getting kind of abusive towards him, saying, I'm gonna beat you up, I don't want you to, to talk to her ever again. And he's like, I need to talk to her. He's mm -hmm. got a kid in common, we can't not talk. And the guy was like, if I see you again, I'll beat you up. But it was him and another guy as well, threatening, threatening my friend. And he was lost. He was completely lost. And he came to me and and he and he said, uh, "What can I do?" I was like, I, when I saw him face to face physically, he wasn't the same person. He was lost. Like, was bordering obese. His look was completely different. He wasn't the same guy. I mean, this guy was hard. He mm. had a, a look about him. He was like one of the most. I mean, since he was little, he had this look. He was like a predator and he, and he, and he became a sheep. Hmm. And I'm like, why are you here to learn? You're here to learn some moves that would allow you to would allow you to to deal with a with a with a violent situation. Like you come to me to ask me how to fight. I mean, you are the guy that beat me up for years. We've been worst enemies. You know how to fight because I've been fighting you for years. We know how to fight in the street and everything. Why you come to me for, the, for me, uh, to me for this advice? And it's like, yeah, but you know, I, I, I've seen you, your journey, you become an expert, so I'll just leave, teach me something that can make, give me an edge. And I said, yes, I can teach you that. I can teach you that, but not to you, not right now, because you're not the person I need. I need you to become that person again, and then I'll teach you. Mm. And they were like, what do you mean? It's like, you are lost, my friend. You're fucking lost. You're not the person I knew. I needed to become that guy again. So what I needed to do now, ask from tomorrow, I need to go and start running. I want you to run 20 minutes every day for a week. The week after, you take it to half an hour. By the end of the month, I want you to be doing 45 minutes run every day, no snow box. Take the Sunday off, I start running. I'll see you in a month. Do you know what I did? He fucking got running. He got running, brother. Then I was like, oh, my friend is back. Look at you. Mm -hmm. He was like, I feel great. I feel different. I haven't felt like this for ages. And I haven't felt like this for years. I was like, good. Now I'll teach you something. And I started to build him up physically. I said, avoid those cunts. Avoid those bastards for as long as you can. Even avoid seeing your kid if that helps. Then you will see them. And so we got into the physical, got him stronger, got him faster, then I took him some moves, and then I threw him a cross guard, yeah. and then a bit of punching, and I was like, Marco, you you, you hit one of those guys with, those, with these punches that I told you how to throw, those guys are going to drop like flies. 
So mm-hmm. I would advise you not to fight that because now you're back. Yeah. Now you, my favorite enemy, mm-hmm. you're back. So to answer your question, Rafa, I think I'm here. I've got the power to turn the, the people's lives for the better. Because, but not as a motivational speaking, you know what I mean? Because I mm-hmm. truly have lived adversity in my life. Yeah. And I can, I've got this gift. Because I've, I've, I have lived through adversity, true adversity in my life, and I overcome those adversities, people get that from me. And they turn their life around. Mm-hmm. This is my true gift. No, son. Yeah. Much, much, much appreciated. Resilience, fighting spirit. Yeah. Capacity to we, yeah. we need to look at strength, not weakness. No ways of uh, uh, excusing our weaknesses. Mm-hmm. No, you've got a weakness is a weakness. Strength is strength. Strong, recognize strong. You've got to look for strength. How do you find strength? We can spend another hour on the podcast, but never get, get the full answer. It's full of books. It's full of uh, podcasts over there, and it's all free content. And people can really, truly do their own search and their own self-discovery. But at the end of the day, I can teach you how to make the press up. I can't fucking do it for you. Mm. Are you going to do it? <laughs> This is the bottom line. Are you going to make it? I'll show you the perfect technique. I'll encourage you. I'll, I'll be your, your personal trainer next to you. But are you going to do it? Mm. All the time talking about your problems once again. Yeah. No ifs, no buts, my friend. No ifs, no buts. <laughs> <laughs> Antonio, it's been a pleasure. It's been an honor. Thank you so right. much for your time. It's my here. pleasure as always. And it's been <laughs> my honor that you invited me on, my friend. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated.